Matthew 7 tonight. Now listen, I may or may not have preached this here. I don't know. But when this comes up, I like to, to teach on things that are actually talked about. Why teach on things that happened 80 years ago that aren't happening in our society now? Why? Listen, I, we have to, accusations that get brought up, things that get said in our society, it would, we would do well to study what the Scripture says about it. Now, uh, God doesn't change, His Word doesn't change, but we know that men do change. But uh, ironically, in a nutshell, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Same, same wickedness seems to repeat itself over and over, and it seems to, same questions over and over in our society. And so, you probably heard this one, and I want to I preach about it tonight. And listen, if you heard messages on this, I hope you have, because I don't have anything new. I don't preach things that are new. Uh, typically, I don't. I might, they might be new to me, but rest assured, somebody's already preached them after 2,000 years, right? Somebody's already preached on them. So, um, I don't think it's anything new what I have to say tonight, but I hope it'll help you. Uh, Matthew chapter number 7. You hear this accusation, and this, somebody asked me concerning this not too long ago, and so I, I figured I, I was eventually going to have to preach on it again, just so I can remind you. Because this world has phrases where they take part of the scriptures, and they have no idea what they're saying, and they use them in an effort to silence you. And this is one passage that the world abuses. They may not listen. World may not know uh, any verses. You can't tell. I, I tell people this all the time. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. I said, can you, can you please show me where that's at in the Bible? I know where it's at. I don't tell them that, but I know where it's at. Could you please tell me where that's at in the scriptures? Most of them couldn't tell you. I said, well, I'm glad you can't tell me because I can tell you where it's at. So let's go there and look at the passage. I, I just tell them that, you know. But this is another one of those passages where people will ask you or tell you all the time. If you start trying to reason with them about their need to repent of the life they're living and turn to Jesus, inevitably somebody's going to say to me and you, don't judge. Judge not. They're going to tell you that. Listen, I want to talk about that subject tonight. As Christians, you better not go through life living a life that you don't judge. You're going to be in trouble. But the ultimate judge really does know who's right and who's not. So we're going to talk about that too. There is a small element, a very small element of what they're saying that's true. And we're going to cover that. Now, God's not small. He's big, but I'm just saying there's a small portion of that that they misinterpret, but I want to go to the exact passage that they are really pointing to, which is Matthew chapter number 7. Notice what he says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now watch what he says. He starts out by saying, uh, Judge not that you be not judged. Now listen to me, brethren. Every person sitting in the sound of my voice and not in the sound of my voice is going to be judged. So it's absurd to say, Don't judge and God won't judge you. That's not what it's saying. The context of this, if you'll see, is going to be hypocrisy. The lesson learned in Matthew 7, which a lot of times the world is right about us, we are hypocrites sometimes. Can I submit this to you? Everybody in life is a hypocrite at some time. Nobody lives exactly what they believe 100%. Thank you, son. Appreciate it. But notice what he says here. He says, and why beholdest thou the moat? What's a moat? A moat is a small piece of wood, just a little chip, just a little fragment 
right? Watch what he says here. Why beholdest thou a, a, a mote that is in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Now think about the beam. Now I want to know what I'm talking about. When you build, you build a roof line, or you build uh, some, uh, the main part of the building that's going to hold up the roof, you got a beam that runs all the way down. It's a big piece of wood. It's not a small piece of wood. So you know what he's telling them? You're looking at Brother Marshall, and he's got a small piece of wood in there that he's working on trying to chisel that thing down. And here you got this big old beam, and you're a hypocrite, and here you're going to go cast the same type sin out of his eye, and he ain't got but a little bit because he done tried to whittle away with that thing, get that thing right with God. And here you are with that big old beam stuck in your eye, looking at him saying, that's so, look, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Listen, brethren, I've said this many times. You need to work on your backyard first. You need to clean up your house first. You need to clean up your backyard. It does not mean that we can't deal with sin. What it means is if you're going to be the person God can use to deal with issues of sin, you're going to have to live a holy life and you're going to have to get some things right so that people will respect you when you do make a decision and do try to help them. Watch what it says here. Verse 3, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how would thou say to thy brother, Let me pull the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Look what he says in verse 5. The context of Matthew 7 is determined right there at verse number 5. Now what? Hypocrite. Do you know what? Verse 1, he tells you not to judge. Verse number 5, you know what he tells you to do? Judge. But look how he tells you to do. What he tells you to do. Watch. First cast out the beam that is in thine own eye, then thou shalt clearly see to cast out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. He actually tells you that you can see to ca actually cast it out, and it would be a good thing for you to do then. Once you get your backyard straightened out, then it's a good opportunity to go help that brother get straightened out. Now listen to me. If I got a problem with social drinking, and you're, or let's just say this, you got a problem with social drinking, and I'm a drunkard, that I just go get drunk all the time. But all of them's wrong. All of them's wrong. All of them's wrong. I'm not, I don't favor any of it. <laughs> I don't favor any of it. And scripture-wise, we'll probably teach through that one day. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. That's what the scripture. If there's a woe on it, then there's something wrong. And it doesn't say woe unto him that makes him drunk. It says it gives him drink. If there's some breaks put on it, God puts breaks. That show me one thing in the scriptures that has come good out of getting drunk and drinking and living that lifestyle. You don't see it. But let's just say I had, I, I had a problem. I was just drunk, and I went to uh, uh, Brother Jim or something. I said, hey, um, hey, you need to quit all that drinking that beer on Friday night with your friends. And here I am, a drunk. How am I going to help Jim? I can't help Jim. I need to get it right in my life first. Then I can go to him and say, look, Lord, help me. He helped me. I got things straightened out in my life. I want to help you too. Listen, don't be a hypocrite about it. Get it right in your life so that you can help somebody else. Listen, one thing that's been a blessing to me, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not upset about the things that I had to go through in my childhood. I've gone through a lot in my childhood, uh, some good, some bad. But I'm going to tell you what, God uses the bad, if you got it right, He uses that bad to help minister to somebody else. Because somebody else is going to be struggling with the things you were struggling with. But we need to get things right in our lives first. Notice what he says here. He, go, he, he gives a, a, a little exhortation here, but he picks back up with this su uh, subject. Look at um, verse 13. Enter ye into straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate, 
and narrows the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. Now listen, if you got a false prophet, by definition, calling somebody a false prophet, you have to make a judgment. Do you see that? You have to. You have to. Listen, how do you know a wolf, a wolf in sheep's clothing if you don't make a judgment about it? Listen, and your judgment cannot be your opinion. It has to be the Word of God. How do you know anybody's in error if you don't have this book and the words of this book on your side? Listen, I, 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 I preach against these uh, uh, um, um, prosperity gospel preachers because I can read in the book where it says they promise them liberty, but they themselves are the servants of destruction. They promise them a life that don't exist. They, they promise them the flesh and the lust of the flesh and, and the things down here, and they're not offering them anything heavenly. I don't have a problem speaking against them and saying that they're false prophets because the Word of God says so. But you know what? I have to pass judgment to get to that point. What I'm saying to you in your life when somebody says, judge not that you be not judged, that's not saying, listen, the, what they're quoting is not saying that you can't judge because they only read verse 1. It's saying you need to be careful about being a hypocrite when you pass judgment. You need to get yourself, listen, in ministering. We talked about us being in the ministry together. One thing that will hurt this ministry and prevent us from preaching against sin, I'm just going to tell you the truth, is hypocrisy. It's hard for us to help people. How can we help people out of the sin if we're still in the sin ourselves? I'm not saying we, we don't sin. What I'm saying is, if we aren't out of it ourselves, how can we help somebody come out of it? They're, we're just going to be weighted down with them. Look what he says here. Verse number 16, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or uh, figs of thistles? So you know them by their fruits. Listen, God, that's what God gives us to judge. Now, <laughs> after I've said all that, and we're going to get to this part, so I don't want anybody to get upset with me. Let me let you know something in light of your judgment. Nobody's going to stand before you and give an account. You are not that judge. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Too many Christians go around as if they are the judge of men's souls, whether they're saved or whether they're lost. And there's only one person that I can control uh, his destiny, and that's mine. I can make the choice to love him and serve him myself. I cannot make anybody else love him or serve him. Okay? So I don't want you to misunderstand where I'm going at with this. I'm not jumping off ship and getting into no false doctrine. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. A lot of people don't even know this is written in the scriptures, but it's in the scriptures. Watch what he says here. Chapter 5, he talks about a man that's caught in fornication. You know what he says about that man? You're not to have any fellowship with him. Uh, you're to, you, listen, you're to deliver him unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You know if you do that, you actually have to pass a judgment. How can you do it without passing a judgment? Church discipline is in the scriptures. I didn't invent it. It's in the scriptures. It tells you to withdraw yourself from a brother who walks disorderly, a one who won't work and who's lazy. It tells you to let him eat his own bread in quietness. It tells you not to fellowship with him. Let him get it right. Let him eat his bread in quietness so that he'll repent, get that thing right. Listen, I didn't write that. But that's what it says. You're going to have to pass a judgment to be able to do that. 
But I know this, if a brother's heart really does love God, he's going to get it right. He's going to get it right. Look what he says in verse number 1. Dare any of you having a matter against one another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Whew. Now watch. Uh, and if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that ye shall judge? What are we going to judge? Know ye not ye shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set uh, them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. Listen, in the church there's judgment. You just saw it. It just said that. 1 Corinthians chapter number one, uh, 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at verse 12. He says, Now we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given us of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in uh, words which man's wisdom teacheth, but, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He said, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now watch what he says in verse 15. But he that is spiritual. Now watch. The Bible says the mark of a spiritual person, watch, judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Now, listen. We use this term judgmental. He's judgmental. And what we really mean because that verse right there shows you somebody who's spiritually minded it judges all things. What we mean when we say somebody's judgmental is they're a hypocrite. That's what we really mean to say. Because the Bible does teach the spiritual man judges all things. Let me let you in on this. That means he judges his own life. That means he looks at his own life, she looks at her own life and says, I need to work on this, I need to work on this. Somebody who, who's spiritually minded, they'll judge when to open their mouth and when to keep the mouth shut. They judge all things. Do you know what? You can have the right spirit of judgment and examining things according to the word of God and still be humble and still be right with God and still not turn into a Pharisee? Do you understand? Listen, that book says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not some of us. So when you judge, the person who's spiritually minded, who judges all things, realizes that they have done a lot of things themselves. And so it, you know what it does? Listen, I don't even know if I want to say this or how to say it. I grew up in my Christian life around some tough military men. And they were tough. But my brethren, do you know that you can be right and still humble at the same time? In fact, the Word of God encourages us to be that way. Do you know that humility is not weakness? It's not some wimpy weakness. Listen, as Christians, God does not want us to have a prideful spirit in our lives. Listen, Brother Baker used to give him a hard time. He'd say, uh, the few, the proud, the marine. He'd say, why didn't why your motto, because he was a Navy man. He'd say, why ain't your motto, the few, the humble, the marine? It ain't. But let me say something to you. Regardless of where you're from, 
regardless of where you've been, God expects you to have the right heart. He does. That don't change nothing. Your background doesn't change anything. Anything that happened to you previously, you know, we were talking, it might have been y'all. Yeah, we were. We were talking about how they married and they, they wanted something that they didn't see from their families. And that is a family that stuck together and stuck it out, good, bad times, and wasn't all busted up homes and all that. that listen, listen, I came from a busted home. Mama and Daddy married three times. Well, the last one she didn't marry. The one she had was not her husband, and that said she truly. But let me say something to you. What, regardless of your background, you have to go forward and you have an obligation to find out what that book says and it don't apply to other people and you get exempt. It applies to you too. You too. Do you know what? We can be straight as an arrow and still have the right heart. We can. And listen, I, I, I'm afraid that in a lot of, a lot of Christians, I, listen, it's all flavors, y'all. It's all flavors. I, listen, I don't care who you minister to. They, they all think they're right. We're living in a j generation where it says every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's not good judgment. Listen, we need to do what's right in the eyes of God. You will judge right if you do what's right in the eyes of God. And listen, there's so few. I, listen, I am guilty. I'm guilty. Me, me and them right there, over the years, that one right there has thumped me about something that I needed to work on, and my dad did too. My dad did too. This thing of humility and pride. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for a dad and a father-in-law who didn't let up on me on that and didn't give up in that area. It was an area I was lacking. And it's an area I still struggle with. Is it okay to be that honest? Listen. Listen. We can be right and still do what's pleasing to God and still have the right attitude. Nobody, listen, nobody wants that arrogance. But let me say this. I believe you are to be bold. I am in favor of boldness. But let me tell you the generation... <laughs> that I grew up with. The righteous are bold as a lion. But that means I can jump in somebody's face and get nose to nose and scream to them about what the scripture says. How are you helping anybody? How are you? I know we should earnestly contend. I think you ought to quote Bible verses to people. I think you ought to go round and round with them. I think you ought to wrestle with them uh, in the right spirit. But listen, it ain't helping nobody. I, I watch. and You know what I'm saying is true. You know what I'm saying is true. I watched a man standing on the back of a pickup truck, street preaching, preaching the Word of God, trying to win souls. And he was right for that. But a motorcycle drove by and said, I'll whip your... And he jumped down, said, okay, let's get it. He was young in the Lord, young Marine. God don't want us like that. God don't want us like that. He was young in the Lord, and he wasn't saved long, and there wasn't no excuse. <laughs> wasn't no excuse. I thought it was cool at the time, actually. I can't lie to you about it. But uh, <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool at the time. But I was... I was just newly saved myself. So I thought, that's pretty cool. I'm going to be like that. Until I realized that ain't helping nobody. Do you know that the Lord Jesus was railed on? And he didn't rail back. Do you know that book tells you not to render railing for railing? You don't need to get into that. Listen, if they want to give you, if they want to give you the one finger salute, listen, they do it to me all the time. You say, what do you do? 
I can tell you what I used to do, and that wasn't good. But now I just wave and say, I love you too. It don't bother me no more. It don't bother me. Listen. Listen. We got to learn this. You are responsible for your actions. You're not responsible for anybody else's actions but you. You have to get your flesh under subjection. And you will have your hands full with that. All right. Man, so much more I could say about that. But I'm going to transition right here. Romans chapter number 2. So in light of the fact the Bible does clearly um, teach us to judge. The Bible says in John 7, not to judge according to appearance, but to judge righteous judgment. If you want to go look there, that's John 7, 20 through 24. You can go and check that out. But Romans chapter number 2, watch what he says here in Romans 2. That chapter 1, there's this nasty list of uh, people who've done some abominable things. And then he starts reasoning with the self-righteous people of that, that, that would say that crowd is wicked. And he says this to them. He says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou uh, judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. That's the problem. It's the doing the same things. It's the doing the same things. We can't be judging other people and, and trying to make good judgments in life and we ain't fixed ourselves. We ain't uh, submitted ourselves to God. Look at verse number 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. Thinkest thou this, O Mike Lofton? That's how I like to read the Bible. Do you read the Bible like that? I put my name there when it says, O man. You can put your name there. Uh, Thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same things, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you really think you're going to escape the judgment of God when you're condemning people for actions that you're doing yourself? That's what this whole chapter is about if you want to read it. Verse number four, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, knows that impenitent, that's a heart that won't repent and turn. Impenitent. It's not sorry for what it's doing. Impenitent heart, treasure up thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Listen, while the Bible does teach us to judge righteously, it also reminds you that every single one of us have an appointment with the real judge, the ultimate judge who will reveal the secrets of men. Let's look what it says a little bit later. Look what it says a little bit later here. Look at this. He says, um, verse number 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Look at verse 16. In the day that God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. There is coming a day, Christian. There is coming a day, lost person. Think about this for a minute and please think about it long and hard. All those secret things that are in your heart he said there's nothing covered in Matthew chapter number 10 that's not going to be revealed. God's standard, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now you think about that. The thoughts of your heart. God help me. The idle words that I have uttered. Unfortunately, I have a list. 
And I don't think I'm preaching to people who don't have a list too. Now by that standard, you're going to realize we all got room for improvement. While the spiritual man does judge all things, and you need to make some judgments in your life, it'll keep you out of trouble. You have to judge to stay out of trouble. You have to judge whether to go with these people, whether to associate with them, or whether not to. You've got to make a decision whether if I go there, is that going to take me in a place that's going to cause temptations? You've got to make a lot of judgments. Those are the right judgments to make. But I need you to understand, as I must understand, we all will have to give an account for what we have done. And by that standard that we just saw, that's a high standard. The things that you have thought, and I don't know about you, but I've thought some things I shouldn't have thought. You might have not have killed somebody, but you might have in your mind. And the thought of foolishness is sin. All right, let's look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians 4. I know Jim don't think I can do it, but I might actually finish four seven tonight. Maybe right at it. How about right at it? Can you give me right at it? Jim don't think I can do it. Amen. <laughs> he didn't say amen loud. Thank the Lord. <laughs> All right. The Bible says in verse one, let us so account of us, uh, let us count of us as the ministers of Christ and the stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, is required and steward that a man be found faithful. Uh, but with me it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing of myself, by myself. Yet, now notice, he's not saying he don't judge uh, himself in the sense of himself. He's saying his judgments without the word of God mean absolutely nothing. That's what he's saying. He's saying, if you try to judge something without a righteous standard, you're going to get in trouble. That's what he's saying. Okay? Yea, I judge not my own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby uh, justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, now listen, what things is he saying? He just told you to judge, and then he told you not to judge anything before the time. Okay, what is he talking about here? Now, now notice what he's saying here. Context is very important. Look what he's saying here. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts then shall every man have praise of God. What he's saying, he's not saying the spiritual man judges all things and that's a lie and that's disannulled. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying, when it comes to ultimate judgment on who is saved and who is lost and who is justified in the sight of God and who is not, that's not your business. It's not your business to tell whether a person is saved or not. I hear saved people do it all the time. Now, I'll give an opinion about it. Somebody asked me, I'll give an opinion because people want to know which way to pray, right? As long as we keep in mind, the preacher is, is not the judge. You are not the judge. But we do need to know how to pray for somebody. We do. Listen, a lot of yours have made professions. A lot of mine have made professions, and they don't live it. Mom and daddy are usually the ones that know whether they seem to be real or not. And the truth is this. I could even be wrong about that. Some of them in my heart, I, I pray for some of mine that they'll just really get saved and they may already be saved. They may. Because I'm not the judge. And we have to be very careful about that type of judgment. You don't have the power to throw anybody in a lake of fire. You don't have the power to let anybody in heaven. That type of judgment is not for you to judge. But there are some things you need to judge 
right and wrong in your life and you need to judge the things in your life that would hinder you or that would help you. You need to make those judgments. But when it comes to the ultimate judgment, there's only one judge. Acts chapter number 17, go there. This is what it says about that judge. Acts 17. We see that they got an inscription to the unknown God here in Acts 17. And Paul begins to declare the true God to him, And he says this in verse number 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man who ordained, whereof he's given assurance that unto all men that he has raised him from the dead. Here's the key. Here's the difference between your judgment about a matter and God's judgment about a matter. Look what it says in verse 31 again. Because he has appointed a day when he will judge the world. Two words. What's the next two words? In righteousness. God is always right. And he's appointed a day in the future where Jesus Christ is going to be the judge. Jesus Christ will be the standard. He said, by my word. He said, you have one that shall judge you. My word shall judge you in the last day. John chapter number 12. That's how we'll be judged. And we'll have to give an account for what we've done. Listen, don't play the part. Don't, don't act as if you are the judge, the jury, and the executioner. There's only one that holds that title in one package. And that's the God of heaven. Be careful. Listen, because what will happen, this is what will happen in a church. This is why you've got to be careful about this. Somebody could truly be born again. Truly be born again and is not living it. And instead of putting the effort into trying to get that person to get up and do something for God and get busy, you waste a lot of effort in, in an area that is not your business to be in. You need to stir people up. Listen, I preach as if, as if anybody sitting here could get saved. I preach that way. But the reality is, people who come to church are supposed to be already saved. That's the reality. Church is not for lost people. Listen, now listen, I know I've got to be careful. This is thin ice right here. Very thin ice. But the assembly is the assembly of believers. I'm not saying people ain't got saved in church. I'll raise my hand because I was one of them. So we evangelize even here. The Bible tells us to do the work of evangelists even here. This church is supposed to be for the edification of saved people. That's why it's called the church. It's made up of believers. That's what it's supposed to be for. Let's go to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 12, look at verse number 22, Hebrews 12, 22. <clears throat> Notice what he says, but you are coming to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, to the numeral numerable company of angels, to the general assembly, the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven to the, uh, the God, to God, the judge of who? He's the judge of all. Listen, one thing that you've got to understand is you're not the judge. Now he says the spiritual man judges all things. There's some judgments you have to have in your life. But ultimately, you are, the world does have a point, although they don't understand what they're saying. Basically, the world is saying, I'm under conviction. Please don't, don't say that to me. That's what they're saying. It bothers them when you, when you try to tell them what they're doing is not right. But the ultimate judge there is God. Revelation 20 will close right here. I didn't make it, Jim, but I tried. Revelation 20. Revelation 20. I want to remind you of something right here. Revelation chapter number 20. Great white throne judgment. Verse 
He said, I saw a great white throne, verse 11, him that sat on it, whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before who? Stand before the preacher of Academy Road Baptist Church? I stand before the membership of Academy Road Baptist Church? No. When they stand, they're going to stand before God, who is a righteous judge. And I want you to see how they're judged. And the books were open. You say, what books? I believe Jesus said, you have one that shall judge you. My word, the word that I've spoken shall judge you. I believe the books that are open for judgment are those books of the Bible we call them. Right there. Everywhere you see it, we're judged by the word of God. He says, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Now listen to me. Did you write any of those books? Let me let you in on something. You didn't write none of those books. God wrote those. And it is his business to judge out of those books. And to let somebody in or not. Look at the last verse. Verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Listen, we should judge righteously, but we should also remember ultimately we are not the judge. The world has it half right and out of context. The half they got right is out of context. Listen, we, we have to judge. The verse they quote, Matthew 7, judge not, is not talking about what they're saying. You don't judge me because, uh, you know, uh, you don't have the right to judge me. Yeah, there's some things we do have a right to judge about and we should judge about. Listen, listen to me. Let me show you how this works. Would you allow your kids, let's just say they were three, four, five, would you allow them to go out and walk down the street in an alley that was known and notorious for drug addiction? without you walking with them or without some type of assistance from somebody who's an adult who's mature and understands the danger? Would you? You're judging. You're judgmental. But that's the right kind of judgment, y'all. That's the right kind of judgment. But to put somebody in heaven and hell ain't none of your business. It ain't none of your business. That's God's business. Let him handle his own business. Amen? All right. Any questions? Any questions? I hope it was a blessing to you. hope you all have a good week. All right? Let's stand for prayer.